It is September 17th of 1862. You and I, we're members of Battery B of the 4th U.S. Artillery, and it is our job to support the infantry as they get ready to advance towards the Confederate positions and kick off the Battle of Antietam. Now, shortly after this battle begins, we may be the ones in need of infantry support, and we're about to find out just exactly what I mean by that here at the infamous cornfield at Antietam. So I just want to set the stage for you here real quick. We are looking north directly at the cornfield. Now when the First Corps would initiate their attack, their Iron Brigade would essentially be assaulting straight at us. They would come right through this field and then when they would emerge from this field, they would receive a devastating volley from the Confederate forces that were positioned on the other side of this road here. And if you're still a little confused as to where we are, you can see we are here. The First Corps and the Iron Brigade is coming right through the cornfield directly at us. Now, despite this initial success, you had Hood's division back here. Now his 2,000 soldiers would emerge from the area of the Dunker Church, which hopefully I can see it from here, is in this direction. Now to the left of this giant tree, you can probably make out the tops of the visitor center. Now if you look directly through here, you can see just the top of the Dunker Church. So you had Hood's division emerging from there and they would begin their counterattack, 2,000 strong, surging through this area here. Now, we are going to cover a battery that was moved, a section I should say, of a battery that was moved to the west of the Hagerstown Pike, just over there. So that's where we're headed. Now, one thing I do want to touch on before we cover the actions of Battery B is John Bell Hood. Man, if you look at the engagements this guy was in, he was just surrounded by death in this conflict. He was here at America's bloodiest day at Antietam. He'd find himself at Gettysburg. He would be wounded there. And he would also find himself at places like Franklin, where it was a complete Confederate disaster. And then he was at Nashville, which was another Confederate debacle. I mean, just think about the death that that guy was exposed to. So before you is the cornfield, and we have moved west across the Hagerstown Pike, which is the road directly in front of you. And we are in a location where a section of Battery B would have been brought up in support of the infantry, like we just touched on. So I don't know if you can see it through the corn, but there is a gun here. And we have a gun here, and this section, which is two guns, was brought up, and there is the cornfield, up close and personal now. Now, typically, a artillery battery consisted of four to six guns. Now, I believe the Union batteries were usually six guns, and a section is usually two guns, and a few sections make a battery. So this section was placed in an advanced position in order to support the infantry. Now, when the Union began their assault, the Iron Brigade would have surged into the cornfield here, and as soon as they emerged from the cornfield on the other side, they were met with Confederate lead, and it pretty much blunted their advance. So this attack began with great promise, and now it's essentially stalling. And now the Confederates are getting ready to bring up reinforcements uh, from John Bell Hood's division. And Wofford's Texas Brigade would cross the Hagerstown Pike here and enter the cornfield, driving back the Union forces over 600 yards. Okay, so now the infantry that we were brought up to support is now being pushed back, leaving us out to dry. And this happened extremely fast. And there was no time to get these guns out of here because just right here is now fresh Confederate infantry advancing through the cornfield. And we aren't going unnoticed. You had Hampton's Legion and the 18th Georgia begin to break off. Instead of advancing through the cornfield this way, they now turned and faced this threat on their flank. And remember, these guns are probably pouring canister into the cornfield as fast as they can. And despite how experienced you are, you do not want canister fire on your flank. You don't want any fire on your flank, especially canister. And now you have two unsupported guns of the Union artillery essentially hung out to dry. So those two regiments essentially turned this direction and began advancing towards these two guns, wreaking havoc amongst the artillery crews and horses. If you kill all the horses, you cannot get these guns out of here. So 
this section of battery B was not in good shape right now and things have turned drastically. Now in the process of all this, the remainder of battery B was brought up. So you had four more guns brought up to this uh, general location and this battery was commanded by Captain Joe Campbell. And shortly after arriving in this location, a volley from the Confederate forces tore into Joe Campbell's shoulder, killing his horse and wounding the battery's commander now. Now, Captain Campbell quickly ordered a transfer of command and Captain Campbell was brought back to the rear. Now, I don't know about you, but from my perspective, it's pretty safe to assume that the men of Battery B had every reason to abandon these guns and pull back to the line, a sense of self-preservation. But that didn't happen. The men of Battery B, despite taking heavy casualties from these volleys, literally just on the other side of this road, we're talking 30 yards at the most, despite the casualties that these gun crews were taking, they held their ground. And we're going to touch on three stories that unfolded just in this area, just in this small field, three stories of heroism about Battery B of the 4th U.S. Artillery. And they held this ground and they made the Confederates pay for every inch of that cornfield behind you on the camera. Now our first story of heroism is pretty remarkable. It was made by a 15 year old boy who was a bugler for Battery B. Now his name was John Cook and John Cook assisted Captain Campbell to the rear. And his next task was informing Lieutenant Stewart that he was now in command of the battery. However, after he did that, he noticed that many of these guns were unmanned or hurting for manpower. So 15 year old John Cook, remember he was a bugler, this is a child. Think about what you were doing at 15 years old. He began running around to the casualties of Battery B here, going through their ammo pouches, and he began assisting what remnants of the crews remained, and he was assisting loading these guns. Now, General John Gibbon himself, seeing the condition of the battery, dismounted, and he began assisting loading these guns. Remember, he was the commander of the Iron Brigade who had just surged through the cornfield here, and they were pushed back. So you had a brigade commander and a 15 year old bugler assisting the remnants of Battery B loading and firing these guns. And at one point, the Confederate forces of the 18th Georgia and Hamptons Legion were about 15 to 20 feet away. That's literally less than the distance to, from me to those signs there. Could you imagine? I just couldn't imagine. And these guns were being loaded with canister, double canister, turning them into a massive shotgun just tearing into the Confederate forces here. You can just imagine the sights and the sounds, body parts flying in the air, hearing the crushing and snapping of bones. This is just remarkable that this battery held its ground here. Now, Bugler John Cook, remember he was 15 years old, would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions here on September 17th of 1862. It's just astonishing to me that this 15 year old boy decided that his life was more important for the cause he believed in than self-preservation. I, I can't tell you how much I respect the actions of Mr. Cook here. Now, the second story I wanna share with you is from William Patrick Hogarty, who was in this area as well. Now, he was manning one of these guns completely by himself. Now, I don't know which gun uh, specifically that was, but it was a gun in this field before you here. Now, he was manning and firing this gun completely by himself. And that is when Brigadier General John Gibbon dismounted his horse and began helping Hogarty uh, man one of these guns. Remember, Gibbon was the commander of the Iron Brigade who had just been pushed out of the cornfield here at Antietam. 
and there's an account that Hogarty would run through the stifling Confederate fire here, grab a case shot, cut the fuse so short that it would explode upon leaving the barrel of this Napoleon here, and it would drop scores of Confederate soldiers. Now there was a Texan who was on the receiving end of one of these artillery rounds wrote that, the hottest place I ever saw on earth or want to see hereafter. Legs, arms, and other parts of human bodies were flying in the air like straw in the whirlwind. I just, I'm having trouble envisioning that level of carnage on an area that just seems so peaceful today. So right here in this field, William Patrick Hogarty decided that his life was worth keeping the Confederates at bay. And he would continue to load and fire these guns here at the cornfield. Now the third and final story I want to touch on was from John Johnson, who is also a member of Company B of the 4th United States Artillery. And he was quoted as saying, several attempts were made by the enemy to capture these guns. And at one time they were within 15 or 20 yards. We were firing double canister. I filled every position on the gun, including gunner. Cannoneers had been killed or wounded so rapidly that those remaining had to fill their place. Now remember, these guns required I'm just maybe five to six soldiers per gun. Now when one of those goes down, it makes everyone else's job harder. So imagine two or three men of your artillery piece going down and now you have to fill their roles. It would greatly slow your rate of fire, put a lot more stress on you, and now the Confederates are literally 15 to 20 yards away. Now remember, we're at a time where your rifled musket can probably shoot, depending on the soldier, between two and 400 yards effectively. And we're less than 20 yards apart I, I just can't imagine what was going through this battery's mind right now. Now following the Battle of Antietam, Battery B of the 4th United States Artillery found itself in another bloody battle at Fredericksburg. Now this is where things start getting a little weird. Both men would survive this battle and they'd go on to fight at Fredericksburg. William Hogarty would receive a wound to his left arm. A Confederate shell would strike him just below the elbow amputating his left arm. He would survive his wounds. John Johnson would receive a shrapnel wound to his right arm, tearing away his arm at the shoulder. Both men would survive. Both men would receive Medal of Honors for their actions here at Antietam and their actions at Fredericksburg. Both men would survive the war. That's fascinating to me how their stories are so intertwined. Um, it's just one of the weird coincidences of the Civil War. Um, I hope this video sheds some light on a kind of overlooked portion of the wheat field here. Remember, there was this awful fighting all through this battlefield, all through September 17th of 1862. And this is just a little sliver of that carnage that was unfolding there. Hope you enjoyed this one. And like I always say, we're gonna catch you on the next one. Thank you.